Hello and welcome to Capital Club in Dubai for the first episode of Technology Heroes Unplugged. And it's great to be here at the Capital Club with all of you today. Uh, we will be discussing about how technology can play a key role in creating and innovating new business models and its adoption for us. Um, it gives me great pleasure though to welcome our guests with us today in this episode. Uh, they are Yuri Misnik, uh, the Group CTO of FAP, John Iosifidis, the Group CEO of Al Ghorer Investments, Richard Wingfield, the Chief Data Officer of Alpha Thame, and Anthony Butler, uh, the CTO of IBM uh, Services in Middle East. Capital Club was very interested in wanting to do a discussion and a dialogue given how many of its members come here to drive commerce. Uh, it's a great forum for business uh, discussion and dialogue and technology increasingly is seen as an innovation for how we can drive uh, progress and growth for all of us. And given where we've been for the last few months in the region, we felt it would be a great discussion to have on how cloud itself uh, could become real and possible for us uh, in, in how we engage every day. We thought we'd start tonight not with a definition of what is cloud and what are cloud's benefits, but what is the market reality? So John, I'll turn to you for the first question. What is the current market reality as far as technology and its adoption is concerned today? In terms of technology, it's essential, right? I mean, it, it enabled us to continue operating uh, remotely uh, over the last four to five months. If we were not uh, you know, uh, cloud-based, we would have been actually seriously hampered from our day-to-day -day operations. Um, and in fact, some of our businesses are not. Uh, and what we ended up doing um, was having to actually put everyone into the offices and they were sleeping in the offices to ensure that, you know, people were getting their food. And, and uh, you know, because you know, we're a large miller in the country, a uh, large flour provider in the country, to ensure that continuity of supply happened, we actually ended up quarantining within our own premises because we're not necessarily cloud-based and, and cannot operate remotely. Yuri. I probably would sort of, to add to what John said, is, is we have sort of two parts of the, of the question. One is, one is more around like the traditional challenges with the financial services industry, which we're facing now. So uh, the, uh, sort of the, the revenues, the, the profits are, are getting squeezed, so they're getting smaller. The costs are becoming a bigger challenge and has to be managed much more tightly. So, so for us, and technology in banking is probably one of the biggest cost contributors to, uh, to, to, to our everyday operations. So, so for us, you know, we are looking for an answer to that question and answer that problem. And sort of cloud is definitely a big, big player there. Uh, the second one of the business is sort of the customer expectation and sort of agility. And we've seen a huge amount of uh, uh, people moving to digital channels, especially in the last sort of six, nine months uh, in this country, not just from the normal sort of ATM and, uh, and uh, uh, you know, your digital banking on the mobile, but also even checks and so sort of check deposits, corporates and retail together. So again, how you do it fast enough, how do you get this capability rolled out? But the second part of, of, of this sort of opportunities and challenges happened during the COVID where uh, it was not just getting the people working and sort of having the conferencing solution and document sharing solution and collaboration, etc. But one interesting thing which I think don't, people don't talk too much about is that we realized that we're missing this sort of social connection massively. And uh, we thought about how to do it. And, you know, again, your normal email, Teams, Zoom, whatever you use, don't necessarily, you know, provide this. And we, we went um, through Facebook, which is no one thinks about it as a sort of we're talking about technology cloud-based. So, so there's a technology called Workplace and Facebook, which we're now using quite a lot uh, in the bank to get the social, internal social connectivity. So it's completely separate from your, from your public Facebook. But again, that's something which, again, they can ro quickly roll out for us because it's a software as a service model. And we would be able, we're able to actually quickly use it in sort of coordination with others. So again, business-wise, it's a big, big answer to the business. It's also a great help for us to during the but a, challenging time. But, but the key takeaway really is that social connection is missing in, our, in, in the way we adopt. It's harder. It's, it's harder. harder. 
it, especially in the COVID times. I don't think it's more the adoption of a technology. I think it's more a reality of, of you know, everyone sits at home and watches uh, the screen and looks in the camera. Like, how do you maintain the social, uh, the social dynamics in the organization? It's also a lot more tiring, right? I mean, at the end of the day, I, I've, I've had to start wearing glasses because I'm staring at a screen all the time, right? So... I think we can all say we're, we've had our fair share of cameras in the last few months, and, <laughs> and here we are watching this show online as well. Uh, Richard, just to wrap up that same question with you, given you run a significant role at Alpha Team as well, uh, your observations? Look, I think following on exactly what John and, and Yuri have said, um, you know, having a, a cloud solution allowed us to scale very quickly. So the organization has got 45,000 people. We had only enabled 15,000 people. For us to get that extra 30,000 people up and running, because it was on the cloud, we could literally do it immediately. So we could scale people to work remotely very, very quickly. So that was a, you know, that was a, you know, a huge plus for us. Um, I think the other thing which was interesting for us was there was a direct correlation between cloud-based systems and on-premise systems, because there's no doubt about it, the pandemic caught us short, okay? in terms of our e-commerce platforms and what have you. There was a direct correlation as to how quickly we could scale solutions out as to whether it was a cloud-based solution, you already mentioned software as a service, or a, or a solution that was on-premise. So what we've seen in our organizations is that software as a service now, as a solution, has become very much more prevalent. You know, we talk about agility the whole time. Um, unfortunately, in our organization, agility wasn't a thing until the pandemic came. So, Anthony, you're probably one of the... the uh, the best guys to ask in this town, not a question on cryptocurrency, your personal favorite, um, even though um, Revolut has been very active on that front in the last week or so. Um, but the question really is, let's look at how we define not just cloud, but cloud models and cloud capabilities so we can better understand how we all reacted where, yes, we're using Uber and, and yes, we're all shopping on various e-commerce channels, yet in the background, there's this heavy engine of cloud working away. So. What are the models and the capabilities so, of cloud today? I, mean, I think you can, you can think about cloud as a kind of continuum, and that continuum starts a very long time ago. It starts almost in some sense in the 1970s with, with time sharing and, and so on and so forth. Um, and then you, you had the advent of these, these sort of hyperscale cloud providers. And if you look at a lot of the discussions at that time, it was really around shifting from um, CapEx to OpEx, and so more of a financial transformation. And that was kind of 1.0 of this cloud adoption, and it was focused on things like virtualization, et cetera, et cetera, which was mainly focused on financial metrics. Then what we saw was, and, and I think this is kind of where we are now, is that cloud is not just a means of optimizing your, your cost structures, but it actually lowers the marginal cost for innovation. It allows you to be more agile. So if you need to scale up, instead of having to go and procure hardware and a service provider, et cetera, et cetera, you can take your credit card and you can access that, that service in the cloud based on a, a pay-as-you-go kind of consumption model. Um, and so it allows you to experiment, it allows you to scale, it allows you to be more agile. And what we saw with, um, uh, with COVID is it, it was an accelerant. In, in some sense, it was an accelerant of forces that were already happening, but they just became more, uh, more immediate. Um, and so cloud helped with the resiliency, it helped with uh, agility, and it obviously, it's, it's helping with, with cost. And now I think we're kind of at this inflection point where you're starting to see new models and entirely new businesses that are being built in the cloud. Because, because cloud has lowered the marginal cost of innovation, the barrier to entry for someone to compete with an incumbent in any industry is no longer having to go and acquire a data center and lots of capital. It's now, do you have a good idea and a credit card? So someone you know, in a smallest village can now compete with the largest bank just on the, on the basis of cloud-based technology. scale right? of things. So it's created this uh, yeah. kind of Cambrian explosion of innovation, which has then led to you know, other pressures on, on incumbents. Um, so that's where I think cloud is going. That is, it's not, about, it's not about infrastructure, it's not about CapEx, OpEx, it's fundamentally about agility and, and innovation. And it, it provides the atomic building blocks for that innovation. What are the challenges that CEOs see, first of all, in the, uh, not just the, the adoption of cloud, but the, also how the benefits can be taken more seriously by us? Look, I think uh, one, one of the biggest things at the end of the day on, on any technology solution, whether it's cloud or, or anything that we deploy, far too frequently um, I have my technologists come to me with a solution looking for a problem to solve, right? And, and uh, I think you've got to be very clear on what it, 
the challenges are that you're facing in your businesses and then how do I deploy technology to do that? Um, and now you've got the benefit of being able to deploy that technology in the cloud and that actually gives you the, the benefit of, um, uh, it gives you backup, it's, it's cheaper to do so, you can experiment, you can go up or down, it's a, that whole scalability around that. Um, but, you know, I think I, I also raised the question around, not question, the comment around culture. People fear change, right? And they fear change because it is something different. So to get and adopt a culture of, of change, you also need to engage them in the process of change. Um, so, you know, fr from our point of view, those challenges are really around, around those sorts of things within an organisation. Um, prior to my current role, I was in the finance sector. Uh, you also have regulatory issues, right? And there's regulatory constraints and perceptions around where data is stored, um, uh, et cetera. So, you know, those sorts of things need to actually also be overcome in terms of um, having the regulator keep up to date and with uh, allowing yeah, the adoption of new technologies. So, so just picking on what you said on the adoption of new technologies, uh, benefits, uh, Richard, that you mentioned Alpha Theme are already enjoying. I mean, the benefits are, are, are clearly one that we could talk about uh, CapEx, and you mentioned CapEx and OpEx earlier. Uh, uh, cost savings is clearly there, but then there's security, there's flexibility, there's also quality control, disaster recovery. What benefits would you say are also uh, uh, what CEOs in this region are considering at this point in time? Look, I think the, the whole agility is, and you know, I often say to people, if someone puts the word agile on a peak, PowerPoint, I'm going to headbutt them because everyone talks about agile and no one's doing it. Absolutely no one, but everyone talks about it. You know, how are we going to become agile? But I do think that we are starting to see as we start to start looking at different sort of cloud technologies that we are getting more agile as organizations. And I think CEOs and business leaders are beginning to understand what the word agility actually means. The speed at which you can deploy something. You know, traditionally, the good old days of ERP, you know, give us your requirements, six months later we see you, and guess what, we haven't built what you actually wanted in the first place, so, and it's gonna be six months delayed and whatever. you. What we're seeing right now is, with a lot of these cloud technologies, we're seeing people being able to see the output within literally weeks and not, you know, and not months, and being able to get the business involved and whatever. So I do see that as a big, uh, as a big driver. But, but the reality is, you know, if you speak to the CEOs, the one thing they're gonna look for is cost. So cost is still a massive, massive play. You know, Anthony mentioned it here. Um, CapEx to OpEx is a big play for, for a lot of organizations because it's subscription-based. You can move absolutely everything um, uh, to OpEx. Um, interesting enough, in my previous organization, they measure themselves on EBITDA. So OpEx was a swear word. So we, we somehow had to get some IFRS regulation of how we could capitalize our, our OpEx cost, but anyway, we managed to do that. Well, let's just stay on culture. You kind of jumped ahead one or two questions where I wanted to go with approach first, okay? But given culture seems to be predominant, John's mentioned it, Anthony's alluded, Yuri certainly mentioned it as well. Um, I mean, you've all heard the Peter Drucker quote about how culture eats strategy for breakfast, okay? So one of the quotes that I found in looking at how we could look at the conversation today was from a, a book that I, uh, many of you may have read. It's, it's by uh, James Collins. It's called Good to Great, Why Some Companies Make the Leap and Others Don't. And, and the quote really is, uh, I'm going to read this to you. It's, greatness is not a function of circumstance. Greatness, it turns out, is largely a matter of conscious choice. Okay? Conscious choice. So let's stay on this culture point and the choices we're making. Okay? Uh, and, and there is still a lot of liquidity in different quarters around choices we have to make. What would you say would be some of the ways that we could look at uh, not forcing choices on people, but making conscious choices that at this point in time help the recovery go forward further? But it won't change the fact that today it's all about choices we have to make. And Yuri, I don't know, if you'd like to, to, to take that one first. Yeah, I think, I think sort of, I actually want to say cloud is a choice, and, but it's a conscious choice. It's not, it's not going to happen to you. You have to make it happen yourself. I think that's one big thing. And, you know, one of the examples we did is very simple. We made, and I did in my previous life, and we're doing it right now in uh, FAB, 
So we actually announced our Cloud Per strategy. And the most interesting thing is that it means that if the, if the service team, uh, if the particular business or cross-functional team wants to use Cloud, they don't have to go and ask for permission. They don't have to go and ask for exception. They can go and do it in a right way with regulator approval and controls, et cetera. But if somebody wants to go and buy a bunch of servers and install them in my data center, they have to go to explain it to me, to our finance team, to our risk team, to everyone else. So essentially what we did, we actually reversed the story. We, we removed the barriers for people to start using things and we created more barriers to say, you know, if you want to keep doing the old way, please explain why. And, 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 and sort of it will be a very uncomfortable conversation when you have this explanation. So I think that's just one of the ways of how to you know, make these conscious decisions, right? And um, same applies to uh, you know, VDIs and sort of our virtual desktop infrastructure. Right? We are not doing it on premise, it's a choice. It's not always easy. It sometimes requires extra work initially to get your control framework set up properly, to get your processes set up properly. But once you make this choice, and once you do like the first steps, it becomes much, much easier uh, sort of to go forward. Richard, any thoughts on this? Yeah, look, I think, you know, there's barriers to entry are, are, you know, are definitely coming down. But when it is a conscious choice whether you're going to go to cloud or not. Um, in my previous organization, I used to work for Majid Alpha Tam, now I work for Alpha Tam. That was an awkward, awkward conversation. Um, the CEO basically said to us, and, and it was great because he was a great um, uh, sort of buyer of cloud. He said cloud first and foremost. So we were, we were looking at changing our HR system. And he basically said, do not look at anything else unless it's in the cloud. So for the first time, we looked at systems like Workday, for example. No one had looked at Workday before. You know, it was a cloud system based out of the US and whatever. We only looked at cloud. So I think it was a conscious choice from the top down. And basically he said, anything we did, so similar to what Yuri said, we had to look at cloud first. If we weren't going to go with cloud and we were going to install something on premise, which meant high CapEx costs, you know, high uh, FTE costs, high maintenance costs, whatever, it was a very, very difficult discussion because we had to justify it. But that was the choice made from the top, quite frankly, and then pushed down. So even some people in the lower levels didn't want to do that. They were forced into making that choice. But that was a very senior exec putting a stick in the ground saying, this is the way this organization is moving forward. I'm going to stay on this again. Anthony, you represent the consulting industry in the region in many ways. Okay, a uh, heavy weight to carry on your shoulders. Hopefully good, hopefully good ways. Uh, you, uh, good ones, absolutely. Uh, talent remains a, a challenge for everyone in cloud. Okay, we've discussed the cultural issues, but talent itself is a massive issue. There isn't a week that goes by that I don't get asked by someone, what skills do I build, Naveed, to be relevant to the future? Uh, and I'm still trying to figure that out myself most days. Okay. Um, how do you see this debate on talent coming out in, in relation to leaving culture aside, talent itself, which as, as Richard said, people are concerned about jobs and employment. So how do you see this playing out today practically and how would you encourage us to look? It's not, I mean, there isn't a day you don't see certifications on social media platforms happening more and more. But when Google says it's shaking up the overall academic world as well with new ideas, Help share your thoughts on how human talent becomes relevant. So if you, if you look at what cloud does or what it addresses in a typical enterprise, right, and you take the full spectrum of, of technology-based activities, cloud is displacing a very small piece of it, which is the infrastructure and you know, some software management, things like that. The rest of it, what cloud is, the, the real value of cloud, and the most interesting thing about cloud to me, is that it democratizes access to capabilities that you could never imagine getting in your organization because you can't get the talent and you can't find the people and you can't acquire the software licenses or the hardware or the computing capacity to deliver on that. So what, 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 I, what I think is, has worked well for organizations is, okay, you, you move things to the cloud, fine. That's kind of table stakes in, in some sense. But then what, once you're in the cloud, suddenly you get access to all of the, the capabilities, for example, as around artificial intelligence, right? Which are very easy to procure and experiment in the cloud. So you can start to develop new skills and you can start to, to get access to technologies that would otherwise be you know, unattainable to the average person within the average uh, organization. So I think that that's the really interesting and exciting thing about, about cloud is that it, it amplifies human creativity. Right? Because you're no longer limited and constrained by what you have in your data center, but you have access to you know, a world of different capabilities. Right? And, and you can see what's happened within artificial intelligence, for example, where increasingly 
the secret sauce and the magic is not in the algorithm. The algorithms like TensorFlow, et cetera, et cetera, is all open source, it's all available. It's all there in the cloud. The magic is in the data and the magic is in what you do with the, the models and so on that you train using that data. So I think that, that's where we should focus the discussion ar around cloud, that you know, for, for most people in the technology space, it should be a cause of excitement, not a cause of fear. The other point that I would make is going back a, a long time to the early days of software engineering, there's something called Conway's Law, which was a, a study that looked at how software was constructed. And the finding was that software is constructed in a way that reflects the organization that, that created it, right? So when I, when I talk to organizations about how they can take advantage of the cloud, what I'm seeing is a lot of organizations will pick up what they're doing today in the data center, move it to the cloud, and just keep doing things the same way they always did them, but they're now doing it you know, in, a, in a data center somewhere else in the, in the, in the world. And, it, and that's fine, right? But you're, you're not taking the full advantage of what cloud offers, right? Uh, and so, and what that, one of the things that it offers is speed. So how do you as an organization become fast enough, agile enough, uh, have enough um, uh, delegation of authority that you can take advantage of what cloud offers you, right? Which is, I think, the biggest constraint, that they're not really taking advantage of all the potential that cloud can offer. And that is absolutely an organizational problem and a cultural problem. So things when you hear about DevOps and, and things like that, I always say that it's not a technology problem anymore, it's a, it's a culture problem. So I think there's a symbiotic relationship between culture, uh, organization, and the extent to which you can get benefit from the cloud. Um, they're not isolated, isolated things. I want to add one thing about the people skills. I think, and just what you just said about the business, about the skills in the business, we're getting to the point where we can give the data, specific data which business business needs at a very low cost, at a, any shape they want, and give it to the business. I think the problem is that they, many cases, don't know what to do with that. And and how do we drive these skills in the banking industry, in the retail industry, for the for the supply chain managers, for the you know uh, credit analysts in the business to actually use this data, right? We can give them uh, all the things they need, but can they use it, right? And I think this is a great thing for technology organizations as well, because in this case, in many cases actually, the the focus shifts from okay, you have everything you need, now use it, right, to drive the, the, the benefit. So I think skills is not just about cloud skills in. Uh, in the tech world, it's all about the skills in the business to use all these capabilities you can get. Two examples, I guess. Um, the, the first one was in my previous life, we started doing exactly what you said in terms of providing uh, data-driven or technology-enhanced decision-making. And, and you know, the RMs that actually adopted it, the relationship managers, sorry, I'm using jargon in banking, but the relationship managers that adopted it, their sales and their, and their customer satisfaction scores skyrocketed, right? And they, they consciously adopted the technology and what was available. They took the time and the energy to do it. The ones that actually said, no, no, I know best, started floundering. So that was, they became dinosaurs, right? Um, a second example was something that I actually visited and you named them a, a, a little while ago, um, uh, Uber. I visited their offices as you know, uh, because they were a client at the time. And I remember going through and we were talking to the CFO. And they ran their region across the region out of here with 42 people, right? 39 of those people were actually qualified in terms of um, uh, querying the system and doing SQL structured queries on, on the system. So they could actually sit there and say, is it a good idea or can I find out whether a driver that has been with us for three years is as productive as someone that's been with us for six months? And if they've been productive, if they're not as productive, what do I need to do to become and get them more productive? So 39 out of the 42 people that they had here were actually focused on, on that sort of uh, information and technology. And knew how to do it. I and knew how to do it. They were taught how to do it. Right? But in a, in a traditional organization though, a percentage of those people would have been focused on just the, the lower level infrastructure and things right. like that, right? But cloud, I guess, has freed them to focus on the differentiating value for the organization. Exactly. When you went to the Uber's offices, uh, uh, what was the culture like, John, in terms of the immediate, I'm not asking you to go on the spot here, but literally, what was the cultural changes that you saw or opportunities you saw that we could learn from? Uh, 
you know, we talk agile, but I, I do feel that it was agile. I felt that there was no a hierarchy um, within the organization. Clearly, there is a hierarchy, but it didn't feel hierarchical uh, in the process. Um, uh, you know, people were, the flexibility in terms of hours of work were there that, you know, they, uh, they encouraged and allowed creativity they encouraged and allowed experimentation. Um, you touched on, Yuri, a moment earlier about, you know, uh, experimentation and failing. Well, they, the thing was they actually did it, they didn't do it with their entire population. What they would do is sit there and say, if we've got 400 cars out, I'm going to try this out with 20 vehicles and 20 drivers. And yes, it works, then I will actually do it. So, so yeah, that whole agile um, which, yeah, you're right, is a dirty word in, in some ways, but it is where we're trying to go, um, w was allowed in that, in that sense. And, and I actually was, uh, it, it stuck in my mind. And then to try and take that into a, in a, a banking environment where if you get it wrong is quite, um, uh, it has an impact, right? Because we're actually seriously in, 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 in banking, we're dealing with people's finances, money. One of the things they look for in their bankers is, is security, right? And they, want, they don't necessarily want you to be experimenting per mm. se. Um, maybe you want to... I actually, I sort of agree, but I think there's another angle to it. I think there are two parts of banking. One is sort of the core banking ledgers where your money are held, right? And where you know, you, you're not allowed to make mistakes, right? And Citibank did recently, and now they're looking for $900 million somewhere, right? And this is a problem, operational problem. You don't want to make sure. But there are, there's a massive engagement layer where you try to provide advice to people, you try to get their, you know, get them to do better with their finance. You can, and advice is a very, loaded word in finance. I'm talking about more sort of insights and help. And I think that's where we should experiment a lot. And we, yes. should, we should essentially engage uh, with, you know, retail and actually even with the business customers in terms of giving them hints of how they can do things better, optimize their cash flow potentially, right? And, uh, you know, some things we can, we can pick up one or two or 10 or 20 customers, give them a bit more and see whether, um, whether it helps or whether it doesn't help. So, so I think that's for me is like, I don't like this two-speed, two-speed IT, which Gartner was talking well ago. But, but again, core absolutely right, and Swift payments, core banking, ledgers. That's where it has to be rock solid. But the engagement layer, the, uh, in the, the CX, channels, in yeah. that in that CX experience, you can think about today. How many of you have actually experienced where where your uh, banker comes to you and they've got a mobile device, right, and and they're talking to you online. They're actually showing you or they, they open the account with you on the spot, right? Um, uh, you couldn't have done that 20 years ago and you couldn't have done that 10 years ago. So it actually does make a big difference in the CX experience. You see it in retail. Now we run a few retail brands and it's exactly the same thing. Bizarrely, sales have increased in, in a couple of our retail stores and you would have seen it in Alpha Tain, I'm sure, where they, they have the mobile device and they're actually with the client there and then, rather than someone having to go to queue up at the till. Right, let's just take Reed Hastings' story in terms of how he went to Blockbuster once and said, would you be interested in buying us for about 50 million, invest and become majority shareholder? Well, people often don't say, and you've all, all alluded to it, you're all parts of organizations where there's a successful business model. And, uh, Blockbuster's successful business model was they had a very profitable uh, a late charge uh, process. So every time you return the video late, the DVD late, the returns on that were extremely profitable and it's considerable in their balance sheet. So in that culture, when they looked at the opportunity, someone made a decision that they couldn't make that jump right now. And we all know what happened with Netflix since then. So you, you said culture earlier. Can I add a comment on sure. this? It's anecdotal, but actually it's a real story from real, very large bank, uh, very, very large global bank. And We've been doing a lot of work in digital space, in the retail digital, trying to optimize costs and sort of save, uh, I don't know, 100, 200 million dollars. And then US Federate changed. Uh, and suddenly the bank had 
extra few billions of extra profit coming in just because the rates went higher and you know you live in a bit different so and then it was a very interesting question why are we spending all this energy it was a like blockbuster question why are we spending all this energy and hard work doing this sort of digital optimizations and trying to do while okay here it is a few billion dollars coming essentially from nowhere and like as a banker why would i actually do something and it's super hard to, and actually, this is the point. This is like a real blockbuster moment. Again, it happens every time. Because, you know, the, the, the dynamics of the financial services industry are very different. And, and sort of you, 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 you work with that. So I think it's super hard to keep yourself motivated to sort of doing this small, seemingly non-super profitable things now, but you know they will play sort of late. Yeah. Well, so I think organizations can reach a point where they, they make a calculation that innovating, experimenting is not worth it. It's better to invest in scaling what they already have, which is what a lot of the, the trap that a lot of these organizations fell into when they attained a kind of monopoly status within their industry and thought, that, you know, we'll just hire more salespeople, right, and scale our sales force as opposed to invent, uh, focusing on product innovation, which I think is a trap that many organizations across industries fall into from, from time to time. One of the things we've seen just, just talking about that is um, if you look at established, mature organizations and you look at the procurement process, our procurement process actually forbids us from dealing with startups because it's part of the procurement process to look at their finances and generally very few startups pass that test. So we generally deal with established tier one, you know, the McKinsey's, the Accenture's of the world and then tier two vendors. What's happened in COVID is we've actually taken that away and one of the things we did at uh, Alpha Tame was we actually created a startup challenge. So we used... Um, I can't remember, it, it, but they're based here in the, in the DIFC. Apologies, I, I don't have the name of the company, but we actually used them as an incubator. We put four challenges onto that website and then we just put it out there. And it was absolutely amazing. We got, we got uh, responses from literally all over the world. And then we cherry picked a few which were quite good. And then we used a challenge and they presented to us and whatever. You. And you know, as you say, Anthony, it doesn't, we don't give a damn where they're set, you know, honestly, whether they're in, on the West Coast or they're you know, in the New Zealand, it, you know, it didn't matter. And it was quite interesting because we got a lot of our execs to, to sit in those sessions. And just that discussion, you know, maybe you will talk one going around, just listening to these guys talking was so fundamentally different than talking to someone from a, you know, a tier one consultancy firm. So I'm hoping, I'm hoping that, you know, we're just starting, at, you know, we're still early into the phase, that this concept of dealing with startups is, is going to change. And we are going to give them a much bigger opportunity to come in and show what they've got in, in, you know, in an organization like Alpha Tam, which, as I said, traditionally has never, ever dealt with those type of startups before. A more, a more disruptive continuation of that is what about employees? Because now we've, we, yes. people can work anywhere, right? So you have access to a global talent pool. But one thing I want to play is that actually coming back to cloud is one thing which we need to also realize is if you think about innovation in the large enterprises, monolithic, old, old is the wrong word, slow-ish uh, sort of legacy driven, it was always a problem. You have this great innovation incubation team here on the right, and they did some really great stuff and they found a really great startup. And then you have your technology organization somewhere on the left sitting in the data center and to get this cool stuff from the right to the left, it's almost, almost impossible. Yeah, it's uh, it, it, yeah. it, it, and that's why essentially if you think about the, the labs or the digital labs, innovation labs, which happened in big banks, some of the retail, sort of not always succeeded because of this. You do this cool stuff, but you can't put it through. Control, security, procurement, legal, yeah. et cetera. And on the technology side, cloud is actually the massive differentiator because typically the same technology which startup is using to build their own startup or fintech or whoever, using to build their capabilities, you already have them. You're already using them. So essentially for you transitioning from right to left becomes much, much, much simpler, right? It's not a throw it over the big fence of exactly, the data center. Yeah. It's yeah. actually, you know, copy an account, yeah. re replicate your code a bit and it works. But sh surely, uh, when it, for me, it always does come down to what's the business problem that we're trying to solve. So unless there is a strong business sponsor behind anything that is actually happening, yeah. it's not going to work, right? So so they've, you, you've got to actually have your business leaders saying, I need this, I've got this problem, give me a solution to this problem. And that's where the, the, the hubs actually, you know, the, the experimentation happens and all of that. And, and, in, and in one sense, they're, they're then strong enough to sit there and say to the to the technologists, 
please implement two elements to that. I mean, the first one is we've got to move from input-based uh, uh, management to output-based, mm. and that's a, a really different way of looking at it. And I can I can assure you, there's certain parts of my middle management that were purely input-based. I'm here at nine o'clock. You've got to be, and, and and they will actually schedule Zoom calls. Actually, we're on Teams, so Teams calls to make sure that people were actually there and working, right? Um, so absolutely, but I think the other side of it that actually comes into, and we did touch on it is, you know, people are social creatures by by nature. And I do wonder what, what the impact of uh, cloud-based working from home has actually had on, on the culture within the organization, back to culture. Well, I'm not going to get into culture right now again. I'm conscious of time as well. You've been very kind in sharing your time tonight with us. Um, I wanted to begin wrapping up, not just with um, some statistics that uh, were, were, were launched in uh, 2020. For those of you who are concerned that we may go back to the way it used to be before, uh, cloud has uh, grown as of June this year to a 100 billion US dollar industry. So say the experts. Uh, there are three players dominating the industry. We won't mention them today. But cloud itself is, is really going to remain then a conscious choice for all of us, okay? So I'm now going to make this a little bit more um, uh, personal for each of you by sharing some facts about each of you. You're all here today, not just as leaders, but because you're also uh, very driven to do things which are outliers in your personal lives as well. Richard, you like to swim 20 to 30 kilometers most days. Not okay? most days, but you know, most days. some days. Huh? Okay. Yuri, you started off as a scientist and uh, did all sorts of work with composite materials. Uh, you have taken up kite surfing recently. You're, you're, you're trying new models in your personal life as well. I'm not sure it's a midlife crisis or not. That's a different <laughs> I, conversation. I, 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 but... Understood. John already knows I'm going to talk about his fondness for cars and fast cars and racing and endurance racing. Anthony, you are a workaholic, and I can, I can vouch for that personally. Okay. But given your own, you, you know, you mentioned how we are all in danger, and I'm very grateful for the chance to meet you all in person today and not have us having barriers between conversation. No one's camera is switched off, okay? No one's having to play with the mute button to figure out how we connect and talk. So in this environment, just last thoughts from yourselves before we wrap up for, for this episode of how do we make cloud real? Um, any last thoughts from you, Richard, given your perspectives in life, in how we could look at a model like cloud and making it real. If I look at where we are in our own organization, cloud is there to stay, absolutely. We have made the conscious choice, just, just, just from what I'm doing from a data analytics and, and artificial intelligence perspective, we didn't even look at on-premise, we went straight into the cloud. But obviously, AlphaTame is, is an established long-term uh, you know, organization, big SAP shop, for example, but we've made the decision to even take some of our workloads, which were traditionally always held on premise to move them into the cloud. So from our perspective, I would say over the next three years, you're gonna see 80 to 90% of our workloads sitting in the cloud. So we're gonna have our POS machines running in the cloud. We're gonna have the guys who work on your Toyotas and what have you in the, in the, in the garages, they're gonna be accessing data out of the cloud and what have you. So our view is we have made that conscious choice now to move into the cloud. Yuri, yourself. <sighs> I think sort of my philosophy is that uh, cloud either going to happen and it will be your choice or it will happen to you. Uh, and it will happen to you through competitors who will come up and be better. They will out-innovate you. They will outsmart you. They will have more data, et cetera. And, you know, we, uh, FAB, we prefer to be uh, leading the pack rather than following the pack. So we, we're actively doing cloud-first strategy. It's announced, it's public, it's, and, and we're doing this with... Uh, you know, a, a, a few vendors uh, out there, and uh, for us, that's the the only future, right? And and we actually want to want to want to lead the pack, and we believe that we have probably the best financial services team now uh, in the country, which comes up from different places, including Microsoft, Amazon, uh, you know, IBM, and others, right? So so that's all. Uh, so hopefully, we we actually we 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 we'll make the journey. Anthony. Um, so I would say you should never lose sight of the fact that cloud is a means to an end. It isn't the end in itself, right? Like we shouldn't be dogmatic about it or think that this is the whole you know, end game. And we should think about what a cloud 
allows us to do. So I think it allows us to be more agile, to experiment, um, and also in the context of what's happening at the moment, it allows us, it's, it's kind of, as I said, it's freed us from the physical world in the sense that people can sit anywhere and they can do the work as productive as they, they would have if they were in the office. So, you know, thinking about the second order impacts of that and what it means, where people will live, will they still congregate around offices? I think cloud is going to have a tremendously disruptive uh, uh, effect um, given what it's allowing people to do post pandemic. But I, I, again, I would say never lose sight of the fact that it is only a means to an end and that end ultimately is a business result. It's not something in and of itself uh, that we should all focus on. John, Australia had almost, what, 27 quarters of growth since 1991, 92? Yep. Okay, and suddenly there's a, a, the cloud of a recession. The UK is almost now in a recession. Uh, I started with yourself. The cloud of a recession. The cloud I'm not of sure a recession. that's the intention. The cloud of, of a recession. So last thoughts from you, John, really, in terms of wrapping up, given your focus. No, I, I think uh, uh, Anthony took the words out of my mouth. I think uh, cloud is here to stay. Uh, but it is not the solution. What it is is an enabler. Um, and I think it, the, it's an enabler that allows us to have uh, flexibility um, and it's an, at, at a lower cost in terms of executing our business strategies. So that's it in a nutshell. Right, good. So thank you, everyone, for your time today. Uh, it's been really uh, interesting, not just hearing your perspectives, but also the insights you shared about how the region and also yourselves in your daily uh, engagement at work are dealing with how we could make cloud uh, more prevalent in our, in our business models and our personal lives. So can I just thank everybody who is listening and has come in today to watch and listen and those online watching as well. Thank you for your time today. I, I hope we've been able to demonstrate to you uh, at least the definition of cloud, its purpose, uh, and, and the importance of remaining socially connected in this cloud environment. And last but not least, how it's here to stay. It will be pervasive and it will be a form of technology, a method of technology that is going to dominate our lives for quite some time to come. Thank you very much to all of you.